Oh, hopefully this will uh, get my day off to a good start. Oh. As I mentioned before, whenever I'm packing up, I'm always tempted to leave the kettle behind because the kettle can be bulky. It's just the wrong shape for packing because it's round and it's empty and, and has a handle on it that sticks out. I mean, it's just a, an awkward thing to lug around with you. So I'm always tempted to just, ah, just leave it behind. I can get, you know, go without morning coffee or maybe they'll have hot water here. But every time I bring the kettle, I'm like, ah, I'm so glad I did. So, ah. so yeah, <clears throat> last night I just spent so much time. I mean, it's kind of crazy. I was writing about this to a friend of mine that, it's great that we have online hotel booking. Um, it's nice to be able to do that, but at the same time, it adds one more chore and one more decision you have to make. And like in the old days, of course, when you're backpacking, you just show up at the bus station or on your bicycle, if you're bike touring, and then you just look for hotels and then you ride from one hotel to the next and take a look at the room and ask how much it is. And, and then you usually find something that, that you like. But now you have the ability to book in advance, but that ends up taking longer sometimes for me than looking at the hotels when I get there, if you see what I mean. And now you have so much information it's, and so many hotels to choose from, so many variables to consider, it's kind of overwhelming. Again, in the old days, you, you just took whatever seemed reasonable because you can't look at 100 different hotels or 150 or whatever it is that I looked at last night. You basically want to just get a room and you're happy to put up with anything and you usually find a place that was really comfortable and in a good price range. All these hotels existed back in those days. But yeah, and you can just walk in, look at the room. Yeah, seems okay. And then you're done. Now it's a choice to make and it's a choice where you can fail. You know, it's like a test where you're trying to find a good hotel and you're booking it and paying for it in advance without actually seeing it. And you can actually fail this test and choose badly. And then you keep thinking that you're missing out, you know, by not finding the perfect hotel, you end up staying at this hotel. And then it turns out there was a far better one with balcony and rooftop and this and all these features and for the same price and you missed out and you feel bad that you chose the wrong one. I hear this a lot these days that unhappiness can come from having too many choices that human beings can actually be much happier if they have no choice, then they don't have to stress out about making choices. And I definitely fit in that category sometimes. So yeah, I, I spent a long time trying to find a hotel. I couldn't find one. And then I just went to bed. Like instead of doing my normal pre packing, I would usually pack like to 90% the night before so that I can just get going in the morning. But I was, I, I didn't think I was riding that far, like two, three, four hours at the most. So I didn't have to leave at the crack of dawn. It's not like I was riding to Penang and coming back. So I was more, more willing to leave at a later time. And I didn't pre-pack. And then in the morning I was writing a letter to a friend and I was enjoying a cup of coffee. And then I started all over again looking for hotels and I decided I eventually picked one um, and I did that because I also have to print out a receipt for immigration so I thought as long if I have a confirmed hotel booking on Agoda then I can take the reservation form the confirmation form that Agoda emails you save it to a flash drive and then if I happen to see a printing place I can pop in and, and make uh, print out copies so I thought I might as well get this done as soon as possible and then I have a chance. Of, I, I didn't manage to do it yesterday, but that was the idea. So I did book a room and then 
it was already pretty late in the morning, late for my normal schedule, and I still hadn't really packed yet. So then I started packing and oh, packing turned into a bit of a problem because I haven't packed for a scooter for a while. Um, so I had to work out a whole system, basically what to bring with me and then how to pack it on the scooter. And I had to prepare for rain and uh, things like that. And it just took a lot longer. And of course, I, I wanted to record the day on video. So it's going to make a YouTube video about coming here and like driving my scooter. And to that end, I chose a route that took me farther. I mean, there was a direct route down the main road to Padang, which would, would have been maybe two to two and a half hours. And I didn't want to do that because that road is extremely busy and extremely dangerous. It's a beautiful road, surprisingly. It's got a lot of great scenery, so it's, it's a fun road to ride. And it is fun dealing with all that traffic, but I just wasn't in the mood. And I picked another route that took me in a big circle. Direct to Padang was about 86 kilometers, and the loop was about 122. So it was like 50% farther. So instead of like two to three hours, it'd be like three to four hours of driving. And then of course, because I hadn't pre-packed, it took me a long time to pack up and get everything figured out on the scooter. And by the time I hit the road, it was later than I would like. It might've been as late as 10 o'clock in the morning. I can't remember now, but for me, it was pretty late because early in the morning, there was gorgeous sunshine. And I thought, yes, sunny day. But by the time I left, the sun had disappeared uh, for the most part and, and it had become cloudy. So you wanted to leave early to avoid the possibility of rain. And here I, I was just making mistake after mistake after mistake, just leaving too late in the morning, not being organized enough. But I finally uh, got on the road. And at that point, to be honest, I'd made up my mind to follow the main road because it, had, it was so late and I was worried about the weather. But when I got to the intersection, I'd made an impulse decision and I turned onto the small country road and it went beside a volcanic crater lake, which was gorgeous. Not as dramatic as Lake Toba or Lake Maningjiao. Um, but still very, very nice, uh, much more approachable. Um, both Toba and Maninjiao are like deep, deep inside a crater, you know, with the volcanic crater walls rising up around it. But this one was more smoothed off at the top. So the road, the main road connecting cities went right alongside the lake. It was like a normal lake. It didn't seem like a volcanic crater lake at all was big, much bigger than I expected. It took a long time to ride from one end uh, to the other. And you got some nice views of the lake. So I did that. And that took me to a city called Solcock. Solcock? I think something like that. And then there you kind of turn right, turn 90 degrees. And then you head up into some mountains and then go down through a beautiful winding canyon road like going through valleys and a beautiful beautiful scenery and that was the main reason i went in that direction i want and there was a bunch of lookout points on the road however <laughs> two things went wrong the funny thing is i was worried about choosing which road and i thought well the main road to padang the problem is heavy traffic and the problem with the scenic route would be it would take longer and a greater chance of rain. And it turned out on the scenic route, I got both heavy traffic and heavy rain. Rain like you wouldn't believe. I still, I'm not quite sure what happened exactly, but I started on that winding mountain road, gorgeous scenery. Unfortunately, couldn't see very much because of the clouds and the mist. Everything was just cloud covered. So you didn't really get any views. But what I could see from the road, you know, at the side of the road is really beautiful, really beautiful area. And then I ran into traffic and it was traffic like 
insane traffic, um, gridlock, the like trucks, 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 huge trucks, cars, trucks, and they just went on forever. Basically, it was all backed up on the on the road and had come to a standstill. And I started passing as well as I could a lot of these trucks, and then I started passing on the left because everybody was at a standstill, like nobody was moving. So I was able to ride on the shoulder. There was just enough of a shoulder there. If I was slow and careful, I could ride beside all these trucks going through all these curves. And it went on for such a long time. And eventually, after what seemed like forever, and I thought, I was honestly thinking this traffic was going to go all the way to Padang. It was another 30, 20 or 30 kilometers to Padang. And I thought this gridlocked traffic was starting in Padang and the entire road, and I was going to be dealing with it the entire way down. That was a possibility. Um, or I thought there could be construction or there could be an accident. But the only thing I saw was a little bit of construction, like the you know, landslides, the road was like sliding out from under us. And there were some repairs going on there, but it wasn't severe enough to cause this kind of a log jam. And, um, but I did come across one big truck that was parked across the road, like blocking both lanes of traffic. And it was really hard. Like there's only one place on the front of the truck where cars or trucks could get around it only on one side. And I think that must have been the problem, but I could not for the life of me figure out how that truck ended up like that. It didn't, hadn't crashed or anything. It wasn't flipped over. It was just sitting there on its wheels, sitting diagonally across the road and blocking both lanes. I'm like, well, how did he get there? Like how in the world did he drive his truck into that position and then get stuck? And how, how is it that they haven't been able to at least move him out of the way? Anyway, it was a total mystery. But I figured that had to have been what was causing the log jam. I'm not really sure. But I finally got kind of at the end of the traffic and then it started to rain. And I had prepared for the rain to an extent. And my usual habit with rain is just to pull over, find shelter, whether I'm on a bicycle, if I'm walking or on a scooter, I don't why ride in the rain, right? I mean, it's not like you're going to be, you can't see anything. So you might as well just pull over, find shelter and wait. But I was just not in the mood to wait for some reason. But thinking that I would normally do that, I probably hadn't prepared for the rain 100%. I would only kind of, sort of prepared for the rain. Thinking that when it starts to rain, I'm probably gonna stop anyway. But this time, for whatever reason, I just got stubborn. It's like, ah, because the rain felt like it would last a long time. And I just didn't want to sit at the side of the road underneath some shelter with a bunch of other people on their scooters and then just wait and wait and wait and wait and wait. And then all that traffic that I had passed, it's all going to catch up with me and it's all going to pass me. And so I just got stubborn and I just kept riding thinking and hoping that it's going to be a little bit of a sprinkle. Like sometimes you pull over to the side of the road to wait for the rain to stop, but it never stops there. It's like, that's where it's raining. But had you continued forward, you would get out from under the rain cloud and then it would be, the rain would stop if you kept driving, right? Sometimes that happens. So I thought, okay, I'll just, I'll just keep riding and maybe the rain will disappear because I was up in the mountains and I'm going down. And I figured the more I go down, you know, the less likely there will be rain. Unfortunately, the longer I rode and the more I descended, the heavier the rain got. It just got incredibly, insanely heavy. And to be honest, it was really stupid to keep riding in those conditions. It was so unsafe. I mean, I was still in, in control and there, the traffic had disappeared. So I wasn't dealing with that anymore. And I mean, it wasn't really that dangerous. I shouldn't exaggerate it, but 
it was more dangerous than before. I mean, it would have been safer not to ride in that rain, put it that way. But yeah, I was just feeling stubborn. And then eventually you reach a point of no return because I, I, my rain jacket wasn't really accessible. I mean, I had to put away my GoPro, my main GoPro with the microphone because it would be destroyed by the rain. It wasn't waterproof. And then I had to get out a rain cover and put it around my knapsack and do all these other things. And getting out my rain jacket would have been hard. And I didn't really, I didn't really worry about the rain jacket. I don't generally wear the rain jacket for rain. It's mainly to stay warm. And I was actually quite warm, so I didn't mind getting wet. So I just stayed in my t-shirt and I just got completely soaked. And I figured I can't get any wetter. Like it's not possible to get more wet. So why not just keep riding? And I just rode and I rode and I rode and I kept thinking this rain has to stop. It has to stop at some point. And it just got heavier and heavier and heavier. It was crazy. Anyway, I survived, as you can see. And then it, the rain backed off when I got into the city itself. But then now, once I was in Padang, things got tougher because now I had to constantly refer to my phone for directions, but I couldn't keep my phone in my pocket or anywhere because I was soaking wet and it was still drizzling, it was still raining. So just, I don't know how, how you feel about this, but in my case, the difference between dry weather and wet weather is almost astronomical in terms of difficulty level. It's like whatever you're doing in dry level, in, in dry weather, you try to do that same thing when it's raining and it becomes a hundred times more difficult and annoying. You know, it's just like you can't see, you know, the visor on your scooter has got water pouring down it. you're trying to lift it out of the way. Your hands are soaking wet. Everything's wet. You're trying to get out your smartphone. You have to remove the rain cover from your knapsack. You're digging around in there and then your fingers don't work on the phone because everything's wet, you know, you're trying to, you know, activate it. And, and then uh, you're trying to pull over to the side of the road in order to do this, of course. And there's huge puddles everywhere. Traffic is crazy because of the rain. It's just so much more difficult to do anything in the rain, which is why I normally avoid the rain at all costs. And then just as with my arrival in Bukitingi long ago, I was not impressed with Padang. I mean, you have this image of Padang, you know, it's on the ocean. And I watched a couple of these YouTube travel, not, they're more like tourism videos about all the beautiful sites and everything looks amazing. Everything looks lush. You're looking at everything from the point of view of a drone. You see all the beautiful hills and the ocean and the palm trees. But of course, for real people, normal people who are just arriving on a scooter, it does not look like that at all. All it looks like is any other Indonesian city, just jammed with traffic, crazy intersections, you know, businesses everywhere. It just looks like any city. It doesn't look any different from any city I've been in. You know, you might as well be anywhere. Pekinbaru, Madan. Um, so it's not like I arrived after all that difficulty and it was like, wow, look at this place. Oh, I'm so glad I came here. It was more like, oh, what an ugly place. What am I doing here? Like, why did I work so hard? I should have just gone to the immigration office in Bukitingi. There was no reward arriving in Padang in terms of, you know, the scenery and, and the look of the place. It was just like, you know. I think a lot of foreigners use Padang as a jumping off point to go out to the islands, Mentawi, Mentawai Islands. They're like surfing islands off the coast. And they have a lot of like nice resorts and things like that there, beaches. So I think and there are boats that go out there apparently. I don't know anything about that. I've just heard, I've heard about it, but that's about it. And the town itself maybe just does not have a lot of attractions. You know, they have a big, beautiful mosque right on the ocean that everybody goes to look at. 
and who knows, there might be some, might be some beautiful coastal areas. You know, I'll go out exploring on my scooter, assuming the rain goes away. But anyway, I found my guest house. It's called the Ruma Kita. And it's very low budget. It's as low budget as you can get. This is a tiny, you know, one person room. No, no, no private bathroom. So shared bathrooms outside. But on paper, it looked really good. Actually, people praised it highly, even foreigners that stayed here. You know, they had nothing but good things to say about it, said it felt very homey and relaxing. It was, a, it was the best of the choices that I saw online. And in terms of what you pay for this place, yeah, it's a good deal. Um, I've got Wi-Fi. Uh, so I've spent the whole night um, uploading videos to uh, YouTube which I haven't been able to do for a long time. That, of course, was a hassle because of my, like my computer, for some reason, keeps disconnecting from Wi-Fi. And, um, oh, I think I, yeah, I have to do something here. I forgot, I have to turn this off. Um, the MacBook itself just disconnects all the time. So all night long, I have to babysit it, like every hour, every two hours, whatever, whenever it is I wake up. I have to go over to the MacBook and then check. Oh, it's not connected to Wi-Fi anymore. It stopped uploading. And then I have to reconnect, go back to sleep. An hour later, I check, oh, disconnect it again. You know, I'm getting like 1% upload each time I do this. And then eventually, huh, eventually what I do is connect to Wi-Fi with my phone, with this phone, and then set up a mobile hotspot and then I connect the Mac to the phone and from the phone to the Wi-Fi and for whatever reason that that works better. So that's what I did and then um, I still have tons and tons and tons of videos to upload so that's what I'm going to be doing a lot here. But yeah you get but the Wi-Fi is good is what I started to say you know you get pretty good Wi-Fi get an air conditioner which is a, which is really nice um, I don't use it, as I said before, but they do have a TV with cable, um, stuff like that. And, you know, the mattress is nice, you know, it's a small single bed, but it's a nice comfy mattress. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a nice, uh, nice little room. And the space, the outdoor space, like the common areas are big. I think that this used to be a big house and they put in a few rooms, but they left a lot of open space in the middle, much more than most hotels would do. I mean, most hotels would just fill it with more and more rooms until there's no space left at all. But for whatever reason, they decided to leave very big open spaces. So even though your room feels small, the space feels large. And I have my usual quirks, you know, in the bathrooms out there, I use the bathrooms pretty much for the first time this morning and there there aren't really considering the number of rooms up here there aren't really enough of them there's only two toilets like toilet stalls for all these rooms and one of them is so tiny you know, they, they the way they design these things the way the toilet is situated um, there isn't enough room for me like for my knees because the wall is right here. You try to sit on the toilet and you're just like, your nose is practically touching the wall. It's like, I don't know how a normal human being can get their body into that space, right? And then they have these, uh, a bunch of shower stalls and I go in there and I was pleased to see that they had a hook, but when you're in there, it's like, ugh, like one hook isn't enough because you have to hang up your clothes because you wear your clothes, you know, when you walk from your room to the common bathroom area. You can't, you can't go traipsing nude through the common area. So you, you're wearing clothes, you've got your towel and you've got your toiletries. You, you know, you've got at least three things to hang up and you've got one hook and you're like, uh, and I, me, you know, this is my lifelong crusade is to promote hooks worldwide. You know, they don't cost anything. Go down to your local dollar store, the local hardware store, get a bag of 500 of them for a buck. You know, the ones with the little plastic stick-ons, you know, you peel the back and stick it on. That's all you need. They'll last for a couple of years till the glue lets go and you stick a new one on. 
just put a hook on the door, put hooks around the walls. Even here in this room, I've got a set of hooks here, but there's no hook on the door. There's no hook anywhere else. And um, that caused me a lot of trouble because oh, my arrival was so difficult because I was so wet. Everything was wet. And, uh, you know, all my clothing, head to toe, was, I was soaked through pants, underwear, shirt, sandals. Um, the rain cover that covered my knapsack was soaking wet. And the rain cover doesn't really work. So my knapsack was pretty wet. Things inside my knapsack were wet. And I basically have a lot of gear with me, all my electronics, my Olympus camera, all my GoPro gear, laptop, all my you know, my power cord and all my adapters and everything. I have a lot of stuff. And to unpack when you're soaking wet in a room like this with tight spaces is so difficult to do, you know. And, ah, oh, anyway, I need more hooks. That's what I was saying. I would love to have hooks everywhere. And again, in the old days, I remember staying in all these guest houses when I was cycling and I would want to hang up a lot of things. And for some reason, I could always find places to string a rope. I always have rope with me, of course, and I'll find one place to tie off the rope and I'll tie it off at the other end of the room and I can drape everything over this rope. And lately, for some reason, I've never been able to do that in, in the rooms that I end up with, so. Yeah, I was inside this room just stumbling around and Again, my own fault, but I was just feeling stubborn. And when I was riding on the scooter and the rain started, I just wanted to keep going. I didn't want to mess around. I didn't want hassles. So, you know, I put the GoPro away and then I just kept going. And I had my wallet in my back pocket. There's nothing important in my wallet, but there is money and then a bunch of random business cards. You know, every time I stay at a hotel or go to a restaurant, I'll, I'll snag one of their business cards because I often want to remember the name or the location or something. So that's all that I have in my wallet. And I knew I should take the wallet out of my pocket, put it inside my knapsack to keep it dry, but I didn't want to stop again. Um, the road again was really quite dangerous, curving and winding, heavy trucks thundering past the rain, just pouring down. You can't see anything. The rain was so heavy. I could barely see where I was going and I just didn't want to pull over again and fumble around, removing the rain cover from my knapsack, putting my wallet away, covering up. And every time you open up the knapsack and take the rain cover off, the rain is soaking in more. I just didn't want to bother with any of that and I thought it would be okay. And I reached behind once or twice to feel and I was like, oh, actually it feels kind of dry. It felt like my wallet was sort of sheltered from the rain. It wasn't getting wet. But anyone who's had experience with this in the past knows it's so hard to waterproof. You think you've waterproofed. I mean, I see the, this thing in movies all the time, drives me crazy, movies and TV shows where someone wants to hide something, some papers, some documents, and they wrap it up in a plastic bag and they bury it in the backyard or something thinking it's gonna be safe. Trust me, you can take those papers and you can put them inside 10 layers of plastic, in a bag, inside a bag, inside a bag, tape it up, it is still going to be soaked through and destroyed. Water will get in there. Water is unstoppable. So quite often you think, oh, you know, my, my backpack is fine. You know, I've got a rain cover on it. But then you get to your campsite or your hotel, wherever you're going, you remove the rain cover from your backpack and the backpack is just soaked through. Rain gets in. Anyway, I was feeling for my wallet and I thought, oh, okay, it's probably okay. I'll just leave it there. So I get here and I'm unpacking and I take up my wall and it's just like dripping with water. And the money I had in there was like all stuck together. It was like a solid brick soaking wet. And I'm like peeling each note off one by one. I'm arranging it on, I have this little desk here in this room and I arranged all the money out in a big grid pattern there so it could all dry out. And I have to say that air conditioner has been a lifesaver for me because it's a new one, it's very powerful, and without it, 
everything in this room would still be soaking wet. But I was able, you know, to close the door, run the air conditioner, just, I strung everything out everywhere as much as I could just to let everything air out. And then during the night, everything is not fully dry yet, but getting there. But uh, yeah, so I pull up at this guest house and I was disappointed at first. The neighborhood looks grim, um, just doesn't look inviting. But again, it, it, it's typical, you know, it's typical for one of these big cities in Indonesia. But somehow when I, I wanted to be in the downtown area close to the beach, I wanted to be in the busy bustling area. And I kind of was focusing on those hotels and I thought I picked one that was going to be in a really interesting neighborhood. And then when I got here, it just doesn't feel like that. It was just sort of like, oh, this is where I'm staying. All right. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. There are actually a number of little restaurants up and down, even my street. So yeah, it'll, it'll be fine. But when I first arrived again, I had that feeling of like, why did I just go through all of that? to get here. I mean, Bukatingi as a city is actually much nicer, I think, than Padang, at least first glance. All I've seen <laughs> is a torrential thunderstorm and a bunch of busy, dirty streets. You know, I haven't really explored the city yet, so I shouldn't really start comparing it. But anyway, I didn't have a good first impressions. And the outside of the hotel, or hotel, the, the hostel, the room Akita was sort of like, ooh, that doesn't look so inviting. And I, I read so many reviews about how friendly it was and how homey it was and what a nice place it was to hang out. I had my expectations raised, but then they did this thing here where, again, it's a house. It was designed as a house, not as a hotel. So it has a completely different design. And the, the main floor is just one big empty space. Like there's no architecture at all. There's basically one giant empty room with cement walls and they put a desk off to the right. Like just any desk you could, you know, pick out of, out of a department store. And that, it, that was check-in, you know, that was the hotel check-in. So you, you, don't have, you don't have that feeling of arriving anywhere welcoming or warm or special. It's just big empty warehouse basically. And they did that thing where they turned all the lights off. Um, a lot of hotels do that to save money, which I never really understand and I never like because first impressions are so important. And when your guest walks through the door and basically walks into a dungeon, it's just gloom. It's just like I walked in and it was like, it's like, it's so, it's so dark in here. I can't see anything. And of course there's nobody at the desk and you don't have any sense of welcome, any sense of relief, any sense of, ah, oh, this is my home. You know, you've, you've gone on such a hard, arduous journey to get here. You kind of want that feeling of, ah, oh, I'm, I'm home, I'm safe, I'm welcome. Um, and yet when you walk into a dark, empty warehouse, it doesn't have that feeling, you know, sort of like, oh, well, what the heck, why am I here? Of course, you have to sprinkle in this idea of well, what, what am I paying? I'm paying, I think, 90,000 rupiah per night. So if, if you know anything about prices here or anywhere, that's an amazing deal to get air conditioning, private room. There's even hot water in the bathroom, which blew my mind, you know, comfortable mattress. They supply a towel. It really is a bargain because it's like, um, well, let, let me check just to make sure. So with all the taxes and fees, everything included, I'm paying 115,000 per night, which is $10 Canadian. 750 US or 34 ringgit. So it's a little bit more than, than I remembered, but still, you know, for 750 US a night, it's pretty nice. But then they're all, it's just me and my brain and the little things, like I said, um, I would leave the lights on at least so that when your guests arrive, they, they don't walk into a dark room and they're like, 
because you know, you're coming from out, outside, indoors, and your eyes haven't even adjusted yet. It might look okay to anyone who's hanging out in this giant warehouse room, but when you come in from outside, it just feels like, oh, you don't even think you're at the right place. You think you came in the wrong door. And then, but the guy who checked me in was really friendly. He was nice. Um, and um, my reservation was fine. I booked on a go to, there was no issue with that or with payment. There were very few formalities. And then another guy was handed the key and then he brought me up to the second floor and he didn't speak any English, but he, you know, he showed me around. He said, okay, here's your room, here's your key, here's this, here's that, here's the bathroom. And they have hot, hot and cold water there in a dispenser and they supply coffee. So yeah, yeah, nice enough place. And then, yeah, came all of the unpacking and the room, <laughs> it was a little bit dim for me again, too dark. They always have the, you know, the, the energy saving bulbs in these rooms, which is why I carry my own light bulb. So it's my light bulb right now, which is illuminating me. And I don't think it's really that bright because it's way up in the ceiling and, but anyway, it works. But then it was already gloomy when I came into this room. It was like, ooh. And I couldn't, I couldn't reach the, um, the, the, the ceiling is too high. I couldn't get up there. Couldn't get up there easily anyway. And I had all of my stuff spread out everywhere, dripping wet, soaking wet. So I didn't really want to mess around with the light bulb. So I just left it. And then during the evening, that energy saving bulb kind of burnt out. So it was at a, like if it was, if it was at a brightness of, you know, a hundred for that bulb, it dropped down to like 20% of its normal brightness. It just stopped working. It kind of gave off a little bit of a glow, but it wasn't lit anymore, you know? And then you'd turn off the switch, turn it back on, and then the light, you know, the bulb would turn on, but then it would go dark again. So I've been fighting and fighting with the switch, turning the light on and off, on and off, on and off. And then eventually I just gave up. And the whole, all of last night, I just lived in this dark world where I couldn't see anything. Um, I was using my uh, smartphone light, you know, to sort of uh, get around because, yeah, the light bulb didn't work. And of course, I could have gotten the guy from the front desk, maybe, but it was getting late at night and he probably would have to come in here with a ladder and all my stuff was everywhere. I could barely move around. It's actually physically exhausting in a way to live in such a small space when you have so much complicated gear because you're, you're, you're really having to move carefully. Um, it, yeah, it actually feels tiring to live in a small space like this sometimes. Anyway, um, yeah, light bulb story. Um, and then I, I lived without light all last night and then I woke up this morning, still no light. And then I decided, okay, I've had enough, I'm going to put my own light bulb in the ceiling fixture. But how do I reach it? Like it's way too high for me to reach. So what I did, this room comes with a, um, a stool. So I have this stool. I have it beside the bed for my uh, coffee table. And if I stood on the stool on the mattress, I could just about reach it. So I tried to do that at first, and you'll be happy to hear that I, I uh, thought better of it because this mattress is really soft. And, <laughs> you know, it looks like one of those YouTube videos, the, the, the fail, you know, fail army. You see somebody climbing up on a chair on top of another chair and they're trying to reach a fan or the ceiling or something, trying to get a spider. And you just know the whole tower is gonna collapse and they're gonna come down. And that's what was going to happen to me. You know, I tried at first, I thought, well, who knows, maybe it'll work. And I put the stool on the mattress and I tried to get my feet onto it while holding onto the wall. Like there was nothing to hold onto, there's just a smooth surface. And then the, the stool was like, you know, going like this. Ah. And I could feel my feet and I thought, oh, can I raise myself up? But the higher I tried to raise myself, the more it started to wobble. I thought, okay, there's no way. This, I'm, there's no way I'm gonna be able to do it. I'm, I'm, 
breaking my neck if I try to do this. So I gave up on that approach. And I thought, oh, okay, well, I'll just have to get someone to... Uh, but I didn't really want to get someone because they would just put in another low light energy saving bulb and I wanted to put in my bright bulb. So I thought, okay, maybe I can use the desk. So then I pulled the desk away from the wall as close as I could get it underneath the light fixture. And this desk is, you know, Ikea style, right? It's not designed to hold 190 pounds, 180 pounds, whatever it is I weigh these days. But I thought, you know, I kind of did this engineering analysis of the desk. I was looking for the, um, the structure of it, like where were the load bearing parts? Where was it strongest? Because there's no way I couldn't stand in the middle of the desk. The whole, that it would, I could feel it. it. It won't support the weight of a human body. It'll just crash. But if I stood kind of on the edge, on the corner, and arrange my weight on long, I thought I could do it. So I worked out a whole strategy and I did that. And uh, yeah, it was like a whole MacGyver, you know, Mission Impossible routine. And I could, if I just, uh, the, um, the fixture is recessed so I could reach the ceiling, but then the light bulb was deep, deep inside this fixture. And I'm just like, yeah, I can just get it with my fingers, you know? And uh, anyway, I did it and I survived. And now I have my own light bulb up there. I don't know if it's bright enough or not. I have uh, two lenses for this camera, the Olympus. I have a prime lens, a 12 millimeter, which is a really fast lens. It doesn't need much light. But for this trip, I didn't bring it. I brought a 12 to 35 millimeter zoom because as I suspected, I'd, I would need to adjust the distance um, because now, just the way this room is, the mattress is too bouncy. I couldn't put my tripod on the mattress. I had to put it on the desk. So the camera is like seven, eight feet away from me now. It's far, far, far away. But then with the zoom lens, I can still zoom in a little bit. But of course that means it isn't as bright as my 12 millimeter. So I'm hoping this is bright enough with that bulb. But anyway, it's much nicer in here now. Ah, uh, oh yeah, Whew. the other adventure was dinner. <clears throat> I needed to get something to eat. And of course, the rain never stopped. And it came in here in Padang as well. As I rode into town, it turned into kind of a drizzle, a rain, a light rain for my whole ride here, I think. And, but then after I moved in, I could hear thunderous rain out there. It picked up. Maybe the storm that was in the mountains that I rode through kind of drifted down was now over top of the city and it just poured and poured and poured. And I waited and waited and waited because I wanted the rain to stop before I went out looking for something to eat. But eventually, you know, it became clear it, this rain was not going to stop. So if I wanted to get something to eat, um, I, I've just got to go. So I put on my rain jacket and I got my, my umbrella. I had to get my umbrella from the scooter because it was inside the seat compartment. So I went out there and yeah, put the key in the ignition, pop open the thing, get out the umbrella. And the rain is just torrents of it coming down. I'm fighting with the umbrella. I'm fighting with my glasses. I'm fighting with um, my, my, I'm trying to keep my day pack close to my chest, like under the umbrella. Because if you put it on your back, the umbrella doesn't cover it and your knapsack is just going to get soaked again. Anyway, it was just a mess and I'm trying to walk through these streets and ah, rain makes life so difficult. And of course, there's nowhere to walk in Indonesia, like there's no sidewalks or anything separate from the road. So you're out in the road, but of course the roads are just nothing but floods. You know, puddles everywhere and cars and motorcycles that go by splash you know huge waves of water out of the puddles it's just such a mess and but I found a, a restaurant just up the street and I had um, sate padang a well-known dish here sate padang and soto padang kind of a soup dish and a banana shake <laughs> so I had those three things for dinner and then I'm sitting there 
dinner is over. I'd been there for quite a long time. I was soaking wet when I got there. Like even arriving in a restaurant in the rain is such a hassle because you've got, you know, you want to sit down at a table. This place actually had tables and chairs and things like that. And then you're fumbling with your umbrella, trying to close it. You're trying to take off your rain jacket. You're trying to get settled into your table and you're, you're wet anyway, despite all of your rain protection. It's just, uh, so anyway, I was there for a long time after I settled in, had a pretty good meal, a relatively expensive one for Indonesia as it turned out, but good. And then I was getting ready to go and I felt in my pocket for my hotel key. It's like, okay, make sure I, I, I have my hotel room key, right? And I reach in my pocket and there's my hotel room key. And then it dawned on me, no scooter key in my pocket. It's like, where's the scooter key? And I thought, no, I didn't leave it in the ignition, did I? No, I wouldn't do that. Yes, I would. I was so flustered. I was so thrown off by the rain and, and the whole situation that after I got my umbrella out, I had to use the key to open the seat compartment. I got the umbrella, closed it, and then I just walked away and left the ignition in the scooter. I thought, okay, that would that would be the icing on the cake if through my own stupidity I go back to the Ruma Kita and find out that my scooter is gone, my rented scooter and now, of course, I probably have to pay for a new one. You know, the owner of the scooter, I'm going to have to, you know, <laughs> it's my fault that the scooter was stolen. And um, thought, oh, for Pete's sake. So I quickly, quickly packed up, paid the bill, got out of there, and I walked back. It was only a short distance from that restaurant to this guest house. And then as I'm rounding where you can, I was on this side of the road and the hotel's on this side. And then I don't have, a, there's two cars parked there. My scooter was in between the two cars and I couldn't see it yet. So I have to walk around to get a view. And I'm thinking, oh, please, 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 please be there. Please, you know, have mercy. Please be there. And then, oh, there it is. Ah. And I walk up. Yeah, and there's the key just sitting in the ignition. Anybody could have just hopped on and rode away with the scooter. Though, to be honest, I think stealing a scooter is pretty easy an actual scooter thief he doesn't need the key i think they could start up a scooter pretty easy these days with some kind of a skeleton key or they just break the thing and fire it up but anyway there's no point making it easy for people by leaving the key in the ignition and that's what i did so crazy but i got lucky this time and the uh, scooter was still there nobody stole it well, that is the story, I guess, of my uh, day trip to Padang. Tough day. <laughs> it was a, I mean, it had some good elements. The weather was nice when I rode by the lake. Beautiful scenery over the lake. It was nice to see some new areas. It was kind of ironic, though, that when I finally reached the actual scenic area, my entire reason for going that way on the scooter was to ride through this scenic valley area. And when I got there, that's when I ran into the heavy traffic and the rain. So <laughs> my main reason for coming that route was completely pointless because there were no views and I wanted to avoid the heavy, heavy traffic of the main road, but it turns out that the traffic on my road was even worse than the traffic on the main road because of the accident or the construction or the rainstorm, whatever was causing all these uh, traffic problems. Yeah, crazy day. Far more difficult than I expected. It was supposed to be such a fun, casual, you know, just ride my scooter to Padang, you know, stay in a hotel. And I was really looking forward to having Wi-Fi. And I must say that has been a relief just to be able to connect my phones to Wi-Fi and my laptop and my tablet to Wi-Fi. It's like, ah, internet. You know, I was thirsting for the internet and I finally got the internet again. But I think that is the end of my stories. And um, I'm going to end this behind the scenes video here because I've got to go to immigration. 
I could wait until tomorrow, today's Wednesday, Thursday. I mean, if I really wasn't in the mood, but I think I better go today and I better go there now. I've got to, for, I've got to get copies still of my hotel reservation. I have all the other documents I need already. I think I'm okay but I still need to print out the hotel reservation. So I got to get going right now. It's about eight kilometers away, as it turns out. I thought my hotel was closer than that. But the immigration office is yeah, eight kilometers away. So I got a bit of a ride to get there too, through the city. So that's it. Hopefully it's not pouring rain outside. I haven't looked out the window yet, but I, I don't hear any rain. Should be okay. All right, that is it. Shutting down and uh, wish me luck with immigration. Oh. I can actually feel my heart pounding. Just saying the word immigration, my heart starts beating faster. It's just such a stressful thing to go through. Yeah, you know, it's their job to treat you like a criminal. You know, they're trying to decide if you're in Indonesia for legitimate purposes or whether you are a bad apple and they don't want you in the country. That's their job, you know, so they're not... It's not their job to be your friend, but still going there to extend a tourist visa. And I still, I feel all this stress, you know, feeling like they're going to, uh, you know, not like me and uh, <laughs> be mean to me. Anyway, we'll see what happens. All right. Wish me luck and I'll see you in the next video.